Gurmayoga. A pre last can call you, but while I'm righteous, a Yanu free, Urahu a very Niha, a Hali Apta TGM August A level. And Mr. Speaker, I would like to make a statement regarding the outcome of the review of GCSEs and A level qualifications. I commissioned the review from C on the 1st of October last year, and it is now reported. The review was commissioned following a series of policy announcements in England. These announcements sparked considerable debate about high stakes qualifications across these islands. The Secretary of State for Education in England is at liberty to determine what he feels is right for England. But when the brand is equally shared on a tripartite basis with the North of Ireland and Wales, he and his officials need to give due regard to implications for those jurisdictions. As I outlined last year, I do not believe there is anything fundamentally wrong with GCSEs and A levels we currently have, and CIA's report, report confirms this. The report contains 49 recommendations and helpfully condenses into one vehicle a range of short term, medium term, and long term actions which will provide a way forward for our next generations of learners. The report draws on evidence provided by a wide range of stakeholders and was overseen by an expert group. This group consisted of employers, teachers, FE and HE sectors and educational specialists from the South of Ireland and Scotland. I would personally like to thank that expert group for their contribution to the significant piece of work. This is only the start of the process. I am sure we will continue to call upon members of that group for their views on the detailed work to be taken forward. The report helpfully builds upon the direction of travel that I have set in place here over the last two years. One that is based on engagement with as wide a range of stakeholders as possible, including the teaching profession. This involves listening to their views, challenging and testing those views, and using their expertise and experience to determine the most appropriate way forward for our learners and our economy. The recommendations include both GCSEs and A levels should be retained in the short to medium term, with the revisions to reflect the needs of our education policy and the economy. This would allow the qualifications to be developed to support our curriculum and reflect the needs of employers and higher education. There is also a need for flexibility in GCSEs and A-level qualifications designed to meet individual subject requirements. The qualification system should meet the needs of as wide a range of learners as possible. It is important that study from 14 to 18 enables all our young people to develop wide skills that are of particular importance in further study and employment. I recognise that the teaching prof profession is wary of the implications of significant change, particularly in relation to high-stake qualifications. However, faced with the choice of either defining our own policy or following the Secretary of State for Education's proposed reforms in England, there is unanimous support for the former. We will lead our own path, determine our own future. This review makes recommendations about how GCSEs and A-levels might be taken forward and also how the focus on improvements in literacy, numeracy and ICT skills could be supported by the qualification system. It is important that a qualification system provides opportunities for every young person to achieve his or her potential. Recommendations have been made to develop, support and value alternative qualification routes to the traditional GCSE and A-level pathway. I welcome this as it supports the aims of the entitlement framework to provide all our young people with a rich and varied curriculum. The entitlement framework is now statutory in our schools and the full requirements will be in place by September 2015. It is about providing courses that are relevant to young people, that engage and motivate them, and that provide clear, relevant progression pathways for them to continue in education or move into training or employment. The economy demands that education helps young people prepare for a world of work that is fast changing and very different from when you or I went to school. In 2011-12, some 94.2% of school leavers remained in education, employment or training. And we must continue to work to make sure that the labour market information informs career provision, informs choices, informs young people and their parents at the right time. Young people who see their time in education as relevant are more likely to stay motivated and engaged with their learning. The currency of qualification taken by learners in the North of Ireland must be ensured. Work must continue to provide young people here with qualifications that will, make them, that will take them wherever they wish to go. In the longer term, the sustainability of the qualification strategy will have to be considered, taking account of changes being made to the qualifications in England and Wales 
and discussions on the use of qualifications brands' names. The review draws together lessons from international best practice and we would like to see this work being built upon in the longer term to promote continuous improvements in our qualifications. We need to start developing that vision now for the qualification systems we want to see in 10 to 15 years' time. I am satisfied that this report reflects opinions about the need for short-term changes as well as an imperative to take a longer-term view of the qualification system here. If necessary, this may include consideration of a system which is independent from, although demonstrably comparable with, neighbouring jurisdictions. Given its magnitude and potential impact, I intend to consult upon the recommendations with this final report, following which I will announce my decisions on the way forward. But while I'm cloistral, or CTR Anna, or Gorham, now Munchiraktia, or Vorda Governorie, Austri, or Hismahuri, August Yalti, Arian, Coram Falcha, Riv, Gak Turum. I want to hear the views from MLAs, the teaching profession, boards of governors, employers, parents, and pupils alike. All comments are welcome. This is an extremely important and thought provoking piece of work. It confirms where we are now and what we should strive to be for in the future. Uh, it, confirms, sorry, it confirms where we are now and what we should strive for if we are to, complete it, to compete internationally with the best education provisions in the world. I want to assure the Assembly that I will continue to take decisions which are in the best interest of all our young people, decisions that will safeguard their future, decisions that uh, build upon the positive aspects of our current education system, decisions that reach forward into the next quarter of the century to provide an international educational passport to success. I commend this review to the Assembly and encourage everyone to contribute to the consultation that will follow. Call Mr. Mervyn Story. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Principal Speaker, and I thank the Minister for the statement today and also for facilitating uh, for myself and the Vice Chair of the Education Committee a briefing before he came uh, to the House. And could I encourage the Minister uh, to make the SEA report? Uh, with its 49 recommendations available to the committee as soon as possible and to members of the House. Uh, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker, I note that the Minister referenced to concerns about the way forward and welcome his recognition of the need to maintain the currency. I have been on public record as saying that we need to ensure that the transportability of our qualifications is not reduced to the proverbial Ulster Bank £5 note in terms of acceptance in other uh, parts of the United Kingdom. And I would encourage the Minister to do all in his power to ensure that the issue of transportability uh, is maintained. Uh, in terms of the, it, this is a very short statement on a very big issue, and perhaps uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, you will indulge me if I could ask the Minister if he could tell us just a little more about uh, what he is planning. I would welcome the fact, however, it would seem that the Minister is defending a traditional route uh, this morning or this afternoon in the House. Maybe that issue might be transportable to other areas uh, which uh, is uh, in the public domain at the moment. He has given us uh, some information, however, I'd appreciate if he could expand. Has he given up on the three-country model of accreditation? Uh, and is he to consult further with his counterparts uh, in Westminster on the way forward in relation to GCSEs uh, and A-levels? And also, could he also in uh, inform the House, what are the alternative qualification routes and progression pathways he is consulting upon? And finally, what elements of international best practice will he draw upon in his uh, longer term plans for qualification systems? And finally, finally, Mr Deputy Speaker, will he now begin, as a matter of urgency, the work of producing a 14 to 19 policy to provide an appropriate for, uh, format for this particular important issue? I thank you for your indulgence, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, I thank the Chair for the Committee for his questions. Um, I, I, have, I haven't given up on uh, the three jurisdictions qualifications. Though I suspect others have. I suspect that others, and they're perfectly entitled to do so, have set a pathway which they believe suits their requirements and their education system and their vision for education, and they're perfectly entitled to do that. I will continue to engage with both my English counterpart and my Welsh counterpart about the way forward. Um, we will be sharing uh, our report with them uh, and the recommendations contained within that report, and I would be happy to take views from them 
uh, on the way forward around that. Just when I'm mentioning the report, of course, the report will be made immediately available to the Education Committee and indeed will be available online to all members of the House and public uh, as soon as th this uh, statement debate is over. Um, I will continue to, as I say, consult with my uh, counterparts on the way forward. In relation to what international best practice do I refer to, the next steps in terms of moving forward to if there is to be radical changes to our education system, it's proposed within the report that we take up to three years research and consultation before we reach that stage. And I think that's only right and proper because we're talking, if we are talking about a fundamental change to our examination systems, I do not believe that is achievable or desirable in the short term. Let's do it in a planned, mapped out way, which is based on best practice and research. And we'll take evidence from uh, best practice internationally wherever it may come from. Uh, that's the way forward. In relation to the 14 to 19 strategy, my officials and officials from uh, Dell continue to engage in that. I accept that we have not reached conclusion on it, though it is one of the recommendations within this report that we have to move forward with a 14 to 19 strategy. Uh, and I will take that into account on the way forward. I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Can call you and I too like the Chair welcome um, today's statement. Uh, I think it's important to go on record to say that um, given the confusion around some of the proposed changes in England uh, with parents and families and the teaching staff that our, our Minister has acted um, to protect the, the, the exams that we have and indeed to quell any confusion here in this part of Ireland um, to make our goals changes. So that, that is certainly to be welcomed. I just wonder if the, the Minister could outline how he will ensure our local exams remain robust and qualifications remain portable throughout these islands. Gordon uh, Thank you, Madam First Question. Um, the issue of portability and the currency of the exams has been form foremost in my mind and indeed in terms of the expert, expert review group and they, they touch on this issue several times within the report. I, I want to see, continue to see a situation where students and potential employees uh, are able to travel across these groups of islands with their examinations and it refers to the statement as a passport uh, of qualifications moving forward. And I think that's vitally important for our, our young people and indeed our own economy moving forward. It's not, uh, there was a reference on the radio this morning that surely it isn't beyond our wit to achieve that. And I don't believe it is beyond our wit to achieve that. Um, if you look at, for instance, the Scottish system, the Scottish run a completely different examination system than the English Welsh ourselves do, or indeed the South of Ireland do, and students are able to transfer quite easily back and forth. Uh, and indeed, in terms of the Dublin government, they run a different exam system again, and many students travel back and forth. And if you look at, indeed, uh, many of our universities, both here and across the water. They now have many, many international students travelling into them. So the comparability issue is something that can and will be resolved. I am in, the report refers to the need for the regulatory bodies to be in constant engagement with each other. I support that. I believe that we, uh, discussion um, and interrogation of each other's exam systems is perfectly capable, and we will be able to move forward with a system where our young people will be able to travel to wherever they wish to travel, in confidence that their exams will be recognised. Again, I call Mr. Dominic Bradley. Gormil Mayogut, a few last concordia. August, a gum breakers, Lishanara, a sock to ratchets, August, a sock to Kutch Fragri Gijisho. A boy lumps a ifri, Danara, a Nintian chelumsa, a core, lean nanawar, fine mach, a vedu, a ganda level. GKSA, August Art Level, Sidoius Gorfager, and Kursi uh, Idjikas, August Kursi Fostriachta, a Kangal Nistluiha Likela. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank the Minister for his statement and for his answers. Could I ask the Minister, does he agree with me uh, that it would be useful to increase the number of applied subjects, both at GCSE? and at air level, as this would help to um, ensure that education and employment were more closely aligned. Uh, thank you, Member, for his question. Uh, the, the report examines this issue and in, uh, in, in some detail. And I believe what we have to do is place equal value on both academic studies and what is commonly known as vocational studies. And the report looks at uh, alternative examinations for those students who do not wish to go on to study A-levels, who may want to go on to other pathways. And that is something that we have to uh, further examine as part of our work moving forward to the future of examination systems. And I refer to the report over the next 10 to 15 years, though there will be shorter term measures 
taking than that. There are many, many different pathways out there for our young people. And we have to be mindful and conscious that all young people may not want to or be able to follow an academic route, and it may not suit their, their needs. It may not even suit the needs of the economy, mm. I have to say. So as, as a society, as parents, as careers advisors, uh, as employers moving forward, we have to place equal value on academic qualifications as well as vocational qualifications. And the report concentrates on this and makes recommendations around the need to bring forward a, a new set of qualifications which are equally valued beside all other qualifications. And I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. Thank you very much, the Deputy Principal Speaker. May I thank the Minister for his statement today and very much welcome the broad direction in which it's going. But if we note from the Westminster Education Committee that the differences that have arisen over GCSEs are deeply, deeply regrettable, what action has the Minister taken to try and stop these divisions occurring? And would he elaborate on what he said earlier and what he's putting in place to make sure that we know exactly what the Welsh and the English will be doing into the future? And just as a, an aside, did he or the department actually uh, respond to the consultation on GCSEs that Ofqual put out? Um, well, in relation to... I, I'm not in a position to comment what uh, the Westminster Committee said in relation to qualifications there. As I've said before, uh, the Secretary of State for Education in England is perfectly entitled to make whatever decisions he feels fit in relation to his education system. Though I would offer some caution that word affects uh, the three jurisdictions that better um, communication should be in place and consultation should be in place before those decisions are made. I intend sharing this report uh, with both my English and Welsh counterparts, and indeed uh, my Scottish and uh, counterpart and the Dublin counterpart in relation to qualifications moving forward. Um, so I, I want to ensure that there is discussions and communications between, between the three. I'm not sure in relation to the, the report you refer to in relation to Ofqual as to whether the department responded to it or not. I suspect that it was largely in relation to changes that were taking place in England. We have had discussions. I have met Michael Gove and my officials have had discussions uh, with his officials on the way forward around GCSEs. But others are making decisions which they feel are right for their jurisdictions. We have had to react to that. I think the pathway mapped out in this report allows us to react to it in a measured, thought-out way without making any knee-jerk reactions, and at the same time ensuring that our qualifications are mutually respected across these islands and that they are portable and the currency of the qualifications can and will be respected. And I call Ms Judith Cochran. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement this morning. I'm beginning to feel my age a little bit because I can remember when the um, O levels were changed over to GCSE. I wasn't the first year of that, it was a couple of years after. Um, others have already mentioned the issue about portability, and I'm just wondering does the Minister en um, envisage that in order um, to uh, best prepare our young people, there may be a need um, for flexibility to teach some subjects? Um, slightly differently, for example, the continued use of the modular system um, for some so that certain topics can be explored um, further over a longer period of time, um, whereas others are maybe better tested under formal exam uh, conditions at the end of year 12? Um, well, uh, in previous changes made by um, Mr Gove in England to the modular and linear system, at that time we, had, we carried out a consultation with the sectors. And it came back that the, our local education system valued modular education in the appropriate subjects. And I decided at that time to keep modular uh, within the appropriate subjects. And I intend to do that. The, the report published today also suggests that we should move forward with modular and linear uh, moving forward. There's no research which would direct us to either being superior models. Though many of our, our, our local educationists tell me that modular learning suits our young people, allows them to progress uh, at, at their pace, though, it's continuing to test them, continuing to ensure that young people's abilities are brought out of them uh, as well. So I intend to continue with modular and linear uh, moving to forward. I met with a number of the English exams bodies and indeed the Welsh exams bodies last week. They currently are going to change their system to provide only linear. They wanted to know was I going to allow them to continue to operate here. I said I would allow them to continue to operate here as long as their exams do not corrupt our curriculum. Mm. 
and that we are not making changes to our curriculum to meet the needs of exams bodies rather than the other way around. I have asked my officials to continue those engagements. I have to say I found the engagement with the, the bodies very, very useful. And I have asked my officials to continue to engage with them uh, on the way forward as we work our way through this report and indeed they as exams bodies work their way through their changes which are being implemented in England. I call Mr Jonathan Craig. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I note from your statement here it says that the report was provided by evidence given by a range of stakeholders and was overseen by an expert group. The group consisted of employers, teachers, FE, HE, sectors, educational specialists. I note with interest from the south of Ireland and Scotland. Can I ask the obvious question, Minister? Why was there not experts there from England and Wales as well? As probably the most key thing that we want to maintain within these islands is that of equivalency of the exam qualifications. And, as you state, this is only the start of the process. Can we have a guarantee from the Minister that in future that expertise will be there? I can assure the member that we and my officials and I continue to engage uh, with the Department of Education in England. I have a very good working relationship with the Department of Education in Wales. Um, my officials have a very good working relationship with the Department of Education in Wales, and there is constant flowback of information and, indeed, uh, pre-warning, pre for the want of a better term, any proposals that are coming from Wales to this direction. The Department of Education in England have their way of working, and that's, that's how they work. And, and I'm not, I, I can't redirect them to work a different way. They have made their decisions on how they, how they operate, how they work, etc., uh, and at times I don't believe it is the most helpful way forward. But we do keep lines of communication open and uh, we will continue to do so. The expert group uh, was brought together from the, from the different jurisdictions because currently Scotland is not going through a change programme. Scotland have their examinations in place and it's completely different from what we have. Uh, the South have a different exam system. Again, now they have went through some changes in relation to their junior cert, etc. But they brought a different perspective again to the GCSE debate, etc. And that's why I thought they, they were of value uh, to the expert group. But the expert group, the list of for those who are members of the expert group is published in the report. And I think it brings together a very mixed range of backgrounds, a very mixed range of career pathways, which only added value to our report. And I think the, the group has been very, very useful. And I thank them for their work. You and I call Ms. Michaela Boyle. Good. Cam Cody, can I thank the Minister for his statement to the House today? And can I ask the Minister, in the best interests of all of our young people and their academic abilities, can the Minister outline what long-term opportunities may be created with the changes announced today? Well, I don't wish to preempt uh, the long-term changes to our qualification systems. While I am on record as saying that I would not have um, commence down this pathway at this stage. I think the decisions that have been made in England have allowed us to start a journey, uh, which we will have yet to map out the, the final pathway to, but it has allowed us to start a debate about our, about our qualifications, um, what those qualifications should be, what those qualifications should test within our young people, and what those qualifications should bring out within our young people. So long term, I want to see a qualification system that allows all of our young people to cherish their education to allow us to test the abilities of all our young people moving forward in education and to have a qualification system which both our universities and our employers and parents and young people understand and where we value all the qualifications coming out of them. As I said to one of the previous contributors, we should place equal value on academic and vocational qualifications because the changing nature of our economy uh, means that our young people have to be flexible in their skills and their ability to deliver those skills in the workplace. And I call Mr. Stephen Moutry. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for bringing this statement to the House uh, this morning, in which he mentions the focus on improvements in literacy, numeracy, and ICT skills. Given that we hear again on the radio this morning about ICT skills shortage, can the Minister give assurances that he would consult with those sectors to endeavour to have relevant, up to date IT and ICT GSEs that fit the current market? Um, I, I can assure the member of that. Uh, over this last number of weeks, I have been engaging with employers from a wide range of backgrounds, but including those who are working in, uh, I have to say, a wide range, but also require IT skills going into their, 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 their companies. 
And those discussions have been very enlightening, I have to say, about the skills base that are currently exists and the absence of uh, skills. If I was to say one of our, our major employers at the minute has had to go to India to recruit because they don't have the, the relatively qualified people here. That sends alarm bells off in my head right away. So I have to say we'll be taking a particular interest uh, in, in the report as it moves forward and the recommendations moving forward, particularly around IT skills, ACT skills and computer science. I'm not convinced we have got it right just yet. I'm not convinced that we have started at an early enough age just yet. And I want also to, when this report looks at our qualifications, I also want to look to see what we can do more in our primary schools uh, in relation to computer science, etc., to turn our young people on to that skills base. You and I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Well, my God, a free last concorda. I was going to break a selection area as Dr. Righteous or Margin. I wonder, could I ask the Minister? It has been mentioned a number of occasions here this morning that equivalency of qualifications across these islands are important, and I don't disagree with that. But is it not more important that whatever qualification system we come up with is based on uh, international best practice? And if we use that criterion, then it doesn't matter where our young people go, the qualifications will always be welcomed. Uh, well, the answer to that, simple answer to that is yes, because our young people are competing in an international market now. Uh, and we want to be ensure that our young people leave our, leave our schools highly qualified, highly motivated, highly skilled, and to invest in our local economy. But, you know, in terms, our, our young people, will, some will make the choice to travel. We want to attract international investors here as well to ensure and, and attract them in a way that they can be confident that our young people are highly qualified. And that's the way forward. It, it's, well, it may be reassuring at times to look around these group of islands and judge ourselves against whether it be the exam system in England, Scotland, Wales or down south. That may be very comforting and give us reassurance at times. We have to judge ourselves against the international best and that's where we want to be. I want to see a case where our exam system is being ex examined by others and, and held up as the way forward. And that, that's where we need to get to in the next number of years. Comes to Sean Rogers. Deputy Speaker, and thanks to the Minister for a statement, and I welcome particularly the evolutionary nature of the whole process. Could I ask the Minister, is it anticipated there will be an increased demand for our qualifications, both from our students here who do English boards at the moment, and from students from England and Wales who are attracted to the continuation of a modular approach? Um, well, I certainly want our, our exam system, as I said previously, to be held up uh, as an international example of the way forward. As I have also said to a previous contributor, I am allowing an open market to remain with, with the, the English and Welsh uh, delivering exams here, as long as it does not corrupt our curriculum. If it starts corrupting our curriculum, then I will have to look at that again. But throughout this report and the consultation with, which uh, was led to the development of this report and the previous changes I made to our examination system and the consultation contained within that, modular exams were highly, uh, highly thought of and regarded within our, current, within our education system, and I intend to keep them. So I would like others to, to look at our examples and say, yes, we want those within our schools, though, as far as I'm aware, the changes that have been made in England have completely ruled out modular uh, within their system. And again, that's a matter for them. Well, Ms. Sandra Overand. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement and, and the interesting responses that, so far. Can the Minister detail what department, public organisation or industry body will ultimately be responsible for informing businesses and employers about the practical differences between the new qualifications? And I also believe that there will be some concern over the restriction of uh, only students only being able to uh, partake of one reset for in particularly English and maths, um, as many of the employers I talk to um, you know, emphasise the need for English and maths. And I wonder, can the Minister indicate his assessment of the English uh, suggestion that students can reset ad infinitum? Um, well, I, I'm not comfortable, I have to say, in terms of speaking about another jurisdiction's uh, decisions. Uh, it's for others to do that. Uh, I, I think what we want to ensure is that our young people travelling through education for 12 or 13 years ensure at the end of that that they, they are capable of passing uh, an exam in English and maths, um, which meets the needs of both the young person 
uh, and also meets the needs of our economy, and that's where we want to be. There, there was concerns expressed in a previous consultation about the number of resets av available and did it devalue the exam once the exam was achieved. I, I accepted those concerns, and I believe that the resets that we have offered are appropriate and ensure that, that young people are tested uh, on ability and that that ability can be then expressed in, in the workplace. Um, I'm sorry, I've, I've got the last part, first part of your question. I'm not sure if there's an opportunity for to restate it. Or I'll take guidance from the Chair. <laughs> Can I detail what department or organisation is going to inform employers and of uh, the difference in qualifications? Well, as part of this review, I, in I insisted that uh, employers from a wide range were involved in the discussions. As we move this report forward and the consultation is brought to an end, whatever recommendations I, that come out of that, I want to ensure that employers are on board and are part of moving forward, in, including the development of new exams, um, because my discussions over this last period of time have been very, very useful. And, you know, we all meet and engage regularly with business leaders and employers, and there is a separation between education and employers, which we need to close. And we need to ensure that our schools understand what employment is going on out there and what employing opportunities are out there, and vice versa. I haven't got the answers to that yet, and that's the reason we're going to consultation. But whatever comes out of this, employer, employers and education have to be one and the same. Yeah, call Mr. Robin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I uh, thank the Minister for his, <coughs> his statement and indeed his answers uh, so far. Uh, Minister, my, my concerns are very much the same as uh, Ms. Overend's uh, concerns. And that really is, and, uh, and I can assume that when those pupils who do GCSEs in Northern Ireland and A-levels in Northern Ireland and decide to go to university will have a benchmark uh, that they can sell uh, in their employment opportunities. But I'm not quite clear in your answers to Ms. Overend that indeed the Northern Ireland qualifications that there is a, a route down which there is an involvement of employers, employer organisations or other outside bodies that can benchmark the qualifications from Northern Ireland against the uh, uh, qualifications that will come into being in England. And that's particularly important where the young person does not go to university but actually seeks employment based on his GCSEs and his A-levels. Um. That work will be carried out in terms of benchmarking against qualifications here, England, Wales, Scotland, down south. That will be carried out by the regular. That, that, that's, there's a system in place which can carry out that work now. We have to ensure that the regulators are engaging with each other, which they are, and we have to ensure that the outcomes of that are uh, transferred, both in terms of knowledge, skills, etc., back to employers to parents, to schools, etc. So when career pathways are being decided in schools, everyone knows what qualifications are required, whether you're staying here or you're moving off into university elsewhere. I'm not here to, to, to have all the answers at this stage in relation to this report. This report poses 49 recommendations. It poses questions to myself as minister and to our society on the way forward in terms of qualifications. I'm sending it out to consultation. There's no point in me standing here and saying, Great 49, 49 recommendations. I have all the answers. Because currently I do not have all the answers. But I am confident that given the research work carried out to date, the recommendations within the report, that we will be able to map a steady course through an evolving education system and qualification system going into the future. And I am confident of that because when I look around these islands and look what the Welsh are doing and I look what the Scottish are doing, they too are, they, the Scottish previously, and the Welsh currently are also mapping their way through that, and their exam systems are highly regarded, they are transferable, and the currency of them is respected. Part of the report concentrates on the views of employers, and I would encourage all members to read the report, but particularly that paragraph, because it's quite enlightening when you hear the reviews of, of employers coming back to the expert group, etc. I think that's, that's an important element of this report, and moving forward, as I've said to Ms. Overend, the views of employers will not be ignored. Again, I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, the, the Minister has told us a few times this morning he doesn't have all the answers, and isn't that why pupils very often fail their exams? Uh, the Minister, I believe, is trying to make the school more relevant to the place of work, and that's something we all welcome. Can I ask him what plans has he got 
to afford teachers the opportunity to spend time in the workplace? And likewise, what incentives are there for people in the workplace to actually join the teaching profession? Well, um, perhaps the wrong answer is as bad as no answer. I think if I was to stand up at this stage, at the start of a, of a consultation process, and say, behold, I have all the answers, then I would be accused of ignoring the consultation. So let the consultation continue. I think we're publishing today a very well-informed report, which I think members will find useful, educators will find useful, and let's respond to it, and let's have a debate about where we want to see our qualification system going in the future. In relation to uh, opportunities for teachers to spend time in employment other than education, you know, there, there itself is, is a question which needs thrust out. Are we prepared to finance periods of leave for our teachers to go out and work in industry? I think we should. Yeah, I, I, I think we should. In terms of the use of modern technology, and this is the conversation I've been having with some of the employers recently. You know, why are we not using more of modern technology of bringing the classroom into the workplace and vice versa, back and forth? Many of our, of our leading business people are very, very busy, but they do want to contribute to society. And I think we should be using more of modern technology to allow those people to come into the classroom via the internet or wherever it may be and allow them to speak directly to teachers and vice versa. In relation to the teaching profession, we are currently looking at to, um, the training of teachers, etc., etc. But perhaps the question that is poised is this. We recruit many of our teachers straight out of uh, post-primary school, 18, 19, 20 years of age. Highly qualified, highly motivated, great young people. Perhaps we should be recruiting them at 25, 30, going into training college and allowing them the experience of the workplace or different environments before they go into the classroom. But that's a question that will be po posed as part of a review of teacher education. Then I call Mr. Jim Allister. My concern about where this may be going is the impact on the buying power of our local qualifications. If you have a situation where Secretary of State Gove is making GCSEs and A-levels more rigorous in the greater part of the United Kingdom, namely England, and if we are going to cling to the easier processes of modules and assessment, are the losers in this not going to be our own students who emerge with qualifications which, when compared with those in the majority of the United Kingdom, will be deemed to be lesser? Uh, so it's the question of portability. The minister has said he's, he's interested in that, but not interested enough to have had on his expert panel someone from the greater part of the United Kingdom, England, where those changes are being made to understand the whys and wherefores and the outworkings of all that. So I repeat Mr Craig's question. Why was that? And are, is he really seriously going to address the portability question? Um, uh, you should not have an inferiority complex about our ability and continued ability to deliver rigorous exams. What evidence do you use to state, and I mean research evidence, educational research evidence to state that the changes being made in England will make their examination system more rigorous. Because I challenge you to produce it. Because I can assure you both the research panel, my own department, I and others have studied this subject with intensity. And no one can produce to me the educational research to suggest that the changes being made in England make our examination system more rigorous. And certainly there's no research to suggest that the changes we have introduced here are which maybe flow from our recommendations. Now we're taking three years, we're going to take three years proposing this report to, to establish a new examination system moving forward. Now, as part of that, we will study what's happening in England, we will study what's happening across the world, and we will end up with a rigorous examination system and I think it is, it is a severe case of inferiority complex, which the member is not usually renowned for, I have to say. But a severe case of inferiority complex if he believes that because we do not follow England, our exam system will be easier. 
There's no research to support your, your thinking on that one. And given your, your reputation as a man who interrogates subjects, I suggest you go back and interrogate this one a wee bit further. Thank you. And I call Mr John McAllister. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister in, in earlier replies has uh, talked about not wanting this to be an insular process. How can he guarantee that when seemingly all we're hearing so far is that it is going to be very much a Northern Ireland model? How will he, if he goes down that road and it does become insular, what will he benchmark any success? How will we know what, what success looks like? Or indeed, uh, in Mr Allister's point as to how, uh, you know, how do you guarantee that standard? How also could I ask the Minister, how does he stop a, an effectively two-tier system developing between our secondary schools and, and grammar schools if they opted for different systems? Um, well, the, the, the different systems. All our schools, regardless of the title on the gate, teach to the same curriculum, and the entitlement framework will be across all our schools uh, by 2015, and indeed it's being rolled out currently. So all our schools have to be entitlement framework compliant, which means that they have to teach a, a wide range of subjects across academia and vocational skills, etc., and have to offer those to their pupils. So schools will require an examination system which offers exams for all those young people. So I'm not overly concerned that there's some way going to be two different systems developed out of this. We, uh, throughout the changes that have been announced in England and their impacts here, as a department, we have been very, very careful to engage with our local educationalists. We have been very, very careful to learn from best practice across these groups of islands, indeed elsewhere, before making any decisions. I have published a report today which recommends that we take three years to uh, research to evaluate the best way forward to match our exam system against the best in the world. So well, how are we going to benchmark it? Well, how does the Scottish benchmark their exam system? You know, it can be done. The Scottish approved it be done. How does the South of Ireland benchmark, benchmark its exam system? It can be done, and it will be done. The Welsh are moving in a different direction than Mr Gove's going. And indeed, Mr Gove will have to benchmark his system as well. So we shouldn't, you know, we shouldn't be thinking to ourselves, oh, how long, if, if there's a break in the GCSE A-level link, we will be at sea on our own and it will be impossible for us to compare exam systems against the best in the world. It is currently done. It will be done in the future. And I have every confidence that after our, the work carried out in this report that we will have an exam system which we can continue to be proud of. Because as I said in my statement, I do not believe that GCSEs and A-levels were that fundamentally flawed that they're required to be overhauled at this stage. Others have set apart, have, have made decisions which make we have an opportunity to do something maybe similar or something different. But let's ensure whatever it is, it's based on research, not on press releases or based on statements elsewhere. It's based on research. Thank you. Order. That concludes questions on the statement. Uh, order the next item of business.